Matt, welcome back to the shop, and this is going to be another shop chat. I like the shop chats, I think people do like the shop chats. I hope they do. Um, what are we talking about? Oh yeah, failure analysis. Analysis. That's how I always remember how to spell that. So, <laughs> licking windows. So someone says, Matt, can you do a series of videos, or a video, or whatever, and yes I can. Uh, can we do a series of videos on failure analysis? You know, he did say, uh, it was very interesting watching your video, blah 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 blah, blowing smoke up my trumpet. Um, but he did say, is there a way, or can you tell us pointers of how to work out stuff ourselves? Yeah, cool, let's do that. Um, we'll use the R3 as an example, because it's fresh in everyone's minds. Uh, we're not going to talk about how stupid they are, or anything shit like that. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about failure analysis. And there are some pointers I can give you. Um, I'll try and make this not so much engineering fubu fucking, you know, words that people don't understand. Just try and make it quite simple. So you have a problem. Let's just say, let's just say, to boost the business of our company, we are going to try and build an engine, an R3 engine, to try and impress the world so people come to us because we look fantastic. Unfortunately, because of our short sightedness and because we don't know what we're doing, we blew it up. Which is fine. Let me make it blatantly clear. Blowing stuff up is awesome. It's good fun. It's costly, but it's good fun. And if money wasn't an option, it would be just all fun. You know what I mean? Um, so, we've got this problem, and let's just say we have done a lot of these mods before. And, or let's just say we haven't, it doesn't matter. So, pointers. Number one, the first thing that you have to have is an understanding of the process which is mainly what these videos are about all, of, all basically all my videos stuff like that apart from saving people money and taking the piss out of people it's understanding the process now it's quite easy for us in this respect because we invented these things as a race we invented these engines if something is that way you know, especially nowadays in the modern times, if something is that shape or they've put that there for that reason, you know, someone's done it for a reason. This thing wasn't dug out the ground, we didn't find it on the dark side of the moon. These things have been manufactured generally in a factory the other side of the world in Japan. Um, so people have intentionally done these things. Uh, when you make things in CAD, for example, just say a few solid works or something, it is a blank sheet, right? There is nothing there. That computer will only do what you tell it to do, and the machines will only make stuff that we've t told it to make. The tolerances and clearances are all down to us and how much money we throw at these machines and these processes. When I say understanding the process, I don't mean you have to understand how they designed it and how they manufactured it and what it's made out of and why they chose their materials. What I mean is, you have to understand how a four-stroke cycle works. You have to understand which way your coolant comes in and out. You have to understand how your gearbox works. You have to understand, basically, these principles. It's probably better than process. Let's put that. We have to understand the principles. And then again, that's what these videos are about. There are books and stuff you can learn. Books are a good place to start. Um, and videos and stuff like that. So number two, as soon as you have this, and you don't have to have the ultimate understanding of these things, there are a lot of guys out there, Burt Munro for example, um, did not know everything about every single engine ever made, it didn't matter, he had a very solid understanding of how these systems worked. But not only because uh, how these processes or principles um, were defined, um, not just through book learning and college and maybe university or whatever, but also through experience. Um, so the next one is understanding the system. 
No two engines are the same, unless it's the same engine been remanufactured. And even then, even then, that engine will have a slightly different characteristic than that one. You've got to understand the system you have. So now you understand um, rotational inertia and forces and torque and gear ratios. And now you have that understanding principles. You've, you've understood those principles. The next thing you have to do is understand the system you have. What is the best way to do this if you have a particular engine? Read through the fucking service manual. Why do I say that? They have spent time, and this comes from the people who have designed that engine, right? They're the ones who have the um, cross sections of stuff. They fucking designed it. They put these things there. Read through it three or four times. If you're generally practiced in this stuff, then you can read through it once or something. But it is a very good idea to read through the service manual, especially if you don't understand the system. You might think you do and just go, oh, all engines are the same. Well, they are fucking not, obviously. Um, so you've got to understand the system. Exactly where are my old oil passages? Exactly how do my old squirters work? What is that in there? I could have taken apart these cases shown them to them Muppets and said to that, what is that there? That little nubbin thing. That little nubbin thing. It's got a bolt in it and it's got a little gasket, I think, a little o-ring. I'd be like, what is that? And if you go, I don't know. Well, then you don't understand the system. Stop trying to upgrade it and fuck around with it. You can only modify things when you have a good understanding of it. There are not people in geneticists' labs just chucking DNA at whatever and looking at this pool of goo going, well, it ain't doing what I wanted. I wanted fluorescent rats. You know what I mean? You have to understand the process. And it's very difficult for geneticists. I know we're going off on a tangent here, but this isn't a system we designed. This isn't a system um, that we did from the ground up. It is a system that is in place. I'm alive, you're alive, we're here. It's trying to backtrack and understand that system. And it is such an overwhelmingly complicated system that we're trying our best. And this is why fuck-ups, and this is why the things that doctors still say, we are yet to understand this. And they say that word. We are yet to understand the principles of how this works, the functionality, the processes, the chemistry, and how these have knock-on effects with other things. This is why we still do drugs testing with new drugs, even just for fucking headaches and stuff like that. They cannot say this will not make anyone ill. We cannot say this will not someone isn't allergic to this because it's just too much of it it's a massive complicated system is dna and stuff like that um jesus knows i don't know why they don't ask him but um <laughs> yeah so now you understand your system this one well no these two these two you have to understand how these things work there's no point looking at something and going I don't know what that's there for. So if you don't know what that's there for, you don't understand the principle of it, then how can you possibly work out what's wrong with it? Because you're looking at it, it might be broken, there might be a bit missing. You look at it and go... When you look at crankshafts, there are bits on crankshafts that look like they've been sheared off, snapped or broken. And you look at it and go... Is there something missing? <laughs> Is there a... Was there something there before? You know, you have to understand the principles and you have to understand the system that you have. So now that you have that, let's talk about specifically how I came to one of the conclusions, because I must say that it, it isn't the answer, it's a possible answer. And I chose that because it was so abstract and not obviously in your face. Um, with the limited information that I have or we have by watching those videos. So, where do you start with all this? Well, you look at the failure itself. That's the first thing. The failure itself. What is it? We're lucky in this case because we have two pistons, two cylinders, that are in the same system attached to that one crankshaft. So, we've got a failure of one, but we've got um, success here. That doesn't mean it wasn't failing, or it wasn't going to fail, or we never make assumptions, that's the other thing. So we've got one failure and we've got one that's successfully still alive. Um, but this is brilliant because we've got a comparison. 
we've got a comparison between the two, which is awesome. If your entire engine went toast, and you'd be like, oh, fucking don't know where to start, you know what I mean? It's just in bits. If it all just vaporised and turned to dust, you'd have nothing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, generally what happens is, is even if the entire system as a whole is failing, one will fail before the other. If you have four rickety legs on a chair, one will fail first, generally, and then maybe a second one, but by then it's all over, you're on the, on, you're on the floor. Um, we can look at sheared, uh, sheared sections of bolts and stuff, you can see where things start to propagate, where things fail. If you have an electron microscope, if you're lucky enough, you can generally even see an inclusion of where something started, where that crack propagation started. And that brings us back to single crystals. If you have single crystals with no inclusion, then it makes it very hard for a, a crack to propagate. So it's not going to fail early, basically. That's what we're trying to do. But anyway, let's get back to it. Um, so we have a comparison here. And the other thing what we need to know is we want to start to eliminate stuff that it isn't. So when we look at it, we can say, did the crank fail? No. Nope. Did the bearings fail? Did the conrods fail? Did the gearbox fail? Did the castings fail for the housing? Did the cylinders fail? Did the cylinder head? Did we drop a valve? You want to knock all them things off. Now it doesn't mean you can't revisit them. It just means you need to sing. You need to basically hone on what you've got. So now we know what we've got. We've got a piston that looks like shit. We've got cylinder head damage. We've got head damage. We have uh, rings that are probably not in the best state ever. And we've got uh, cylinder damage. Right, so that's the first thing you look at. You say piston, head, rings, cylinders. Now if we just took a picture of that engine, it says, right, it's, it's this top end here. Right, so then we look at the environmental conditions. What are the environmental conditions in this? It's hot. It's uh, reciprocating. We have valve actuation. Valve lift. Let's put the valve lift because the valves are lifting. <laughs> um, but on the other side of that, we also have an oil system. We have a coolant system. Um, and basically that's it. So, what did we change in all this? Well, we changed the pistons, we fucked around with the cylinder head, we probably changed the rings, and the cylinders, I don't know if they changed anything about, but I, from what they said, I don't think they have. From the cool, uh, from this side, it's hot, obviously, it's a heat engine, reciprocation, that's the way it should normally work, valve lifting, valves are fine, uh, oil, oil is um, to remove some of this heat, and the coolant is to remove some of this heat. What's our actual damage? Oh, well, our actual damage looks like a structural failure of the piston. What can cause pistons to fail like that? Well, we look at cracking, um, maybe the reciprocating velocities, the max pit, the peak piston speeds were too fast. If that was the case, we've got two pistons here doing the exact same thing. Um, heat, the heat source comes from fuel, so we've got fuel there as well. So when we look at the actual failure, it's like what caused that to actually fail? How did that fail? The pistons have lost their structural integrity. That's what's happened, right? It was that shape and now it's a mushy mess. So what can cause that? Heat issues, acceleration issues, and this is why it's great to have two pistons. It's great to have two pistons because if it was something that was um, kinematic, if it was something that was um, kinetic, let's just say, not kinematic, if it was kinetic, um, just basically from the motion and movement, then we should see that both pistons do the same thing because they are both rigidly attached to the crankshaft. That is in good nick and the bearings are in good nick and the rods look like they're in good nick. Wonderful. So what we're left with is we're left with a heat problem because the other piston shows no sign of any kind of force-induced damage, i.e. 
it wasn't that the piston was going too fast and then the, it basically just burst through the bosses for the wrist pin and it just fucking flew out and twatted the head. Um, all our valves look fine, they don't look bent, we can measure that, we don't have that information, but we can see that. Or we hope that they'd pretty much put pick up on that. So it's heat damage, it's to the piston. So the piston lives in a hot region, it always does, um, especially at 13,000 RPM <laughs> when you're burning fuel. So what can cause this piston to overheat? Well, we have friction, we have um, combustion itself, so what we want to look at is we want to look at um, what negates these and what negates these is coolant, oil and our fuel. If we don't have enough fuel our temperatures rise, if we don't have enough oil our temperatures rise and if our coolant is too hot or we don't have any temperatures rise, piston failure. So there's a big warning here that's staring us in the face. And this is what they did at TST and what you shouldn't do. Assume anything. You have to plot it out. If you do this in your head or a scrap of paper, it doesn't matter. Do not assume anything. Do not assume that the uh, friction wasn't a problem. Do not assume the combustion wasn't a problem. Do not assume the piston wasn't a problem. The piston lives in a cylinder. Do not assume that that was the right size. All of these things should have been specced out and measured, basically. And that's what you do. You spec out and measure everything and make sure your tolerances, uh, clearances, are within spec. The manual, yet again, our understanding of the system, gives you those numbers. When I say understanding the system, it doesn't mean you just read through it and then just ignore it or go, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought it was. It is a reference that you can always go back to. You know, what's the fucking oil clearances in the SV? I haven't got a bloody clue. Probably 56 microns. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's why we have these reference books. This is why we write shit down. This is why these videos exist. They are reference as well as anything else. No human can keep all of this shit in their mind whatsoever. You know, people ask me questions and I do videos. Sometimes I have to look this shit up. If it's a general principle, I can do it off, generally off the top of my head. Um, but there are a lot of times where I, I have to look at images of R3s and stuff like that and see where the feeds are, see where these things are. So don't, remember, don't forget, never assume anything. Never assume that the piston was the right sizes. We don't have privy to that information. And for this exercise, let's just assume that, for this theoretical discussion, let's just assume that the pistons, the rings, the ring gaps, the, cylinder, the cylinders themselves, let's just assume that everything was in spec. Let's just assume that they did use the right gasket height. Uh, one of the pistons did survive, although it is different and actually has more carbon than it should have, but it did survive and it was kicking along at 13,000 RPM just like the other one was. So, because we have this laid out now, coolant is number one. Did we have any onboard measurements? Did we have any data logging? Did we have whatever? On the bike, on the dial at the bottom, there's this little, it's like a this shape window, I think, if I remember rightly. And it has bars, and it had three bars on it like that. There's your temperature indication. It is not saying that it's gone titty wampus. Maybe that sensor's wrong and the coolant was boiling over. Well, the radiator cap should have popped, and the blokes behind you or whoever on the sideline should have said, you have loads of fucking coolant steam pissing out of your fucking engine. We don't hear or see any of that, so we don't think that that's a problem. Is the pump up to scratch? Well, if that temperature indication can be trusted, which I don't think it, I can't see really why it shouldn't be, but you would test that as well. Like I say, don't assume that it's correct if this is your engine and you're doing a failure analysis on your own kit. Don't assume that that um, temperature sensor works. And in the manuals, again, reading the manuals, if you don't know how to test it, it shows you how to test it. Link it up. Stick it in, same with your thermostat, 
stick it in some hot water, see what reading you get with your multimeter out of it. The manual even instructs you how to test every single component. Again, understanding the system. <coughs> so, let's just say, our coolant, as far as we understand, is good. So that leaves us fuel and our oil systems. From what videos I could see, and I showed you that close-up of the um, 202 sensors that they had, someone did ask, uh, maybe the ECU didn't understand the 202 uh, sensors, that was not part of the EU sy ECU system, that was plugged straight into the dyno, as far as I understand. Maybe I'm wrong there, but I, I would imagine that they've got two gauges on there. They were pretty much reading it about the same, like I say, they have to be wildly out for them to, for it to really be a problem. Um, and as you could see on that dyno run, when they run the dyno run and when they shut the throttle, when they do the run and then shut the throttle, you saw the O2 spike and go right up into the red. That's saying, fucking hell, there's loads of oxygen. That's because the engine's turning, which means the valves turn. If you cut the fuel, air is going in and air is going back out into your exhaust system. So then readings will speak, uh, uh, peak up, peak up uh, spike out like a motherfucker because it's just, wow, shit, loads of oxygen. Um, so yeah, so we've got fuel and oxygen and from what we can see, it appears that them levels were within tolerance. They're what we expect. So, that leaves our oil, it also leaves friction. Well, these two are intertwined with each other, like so. Um, the combustion itself is obviously what killed it. If there was no combustion, there would be no heat, there would be no problem. Um, this does not rule out that our air fuel mixtures aren't incorrect. Um, like I say, the problem with O2 sensors is they are a um, indirect measurement. They are a, um, what's the fucking word, I forgot it already. An inferred measurement. You are not measuring your air fuel ratios. That is calculated by our engine. It takes in how much air is going in, what temperature that air is, what pressure that air is at because that gives it the density, and then it adds fuel accordingly. Could in so back on our fuel though, our O2 sensors could be all good when we run it on the diner, but when we go out, maybe the fuel filters blocked, or maybe the fuel pumps blocked. Or maybe if that was the case, it'd probably starve both cylinders. Maybe that injector that's on that one cylinder is blocked. So it's leaning it out extremely and all this. That is a possible a possibility as well. Um, the way to test that is onboard diagnostics with your O2 sensors as the bike actually failed. This is why data logging is so is basically really a really good way of testing these things. And why MotoGP go to such extremes of having data login log on board so when something fails they've got two weeks to sort this shit out. So they want actual race data. But again, let's just assume that that's okay. But these are all avenues to look at. So, injectors. Injectors and the flow of the injectors. Injector flow. Uh, AF ratios. The problem is, is the engine's now toast, <laughs> hence why onboard um, data logging would be excellent here. Um, if that nozzle was blocked, like I said, in a possibility in my thing, uh, in my video, then your oil pressures uh, probably are, your oil pressure might spike ever so slightly because now it's going through one nozzle instead of two. That's a restriction, so your oil pressure might have crept up but you would have to have data to compare that against. So basically a race where it didn't go, you know, where it didn't pop and it survived versus the day that, the day that it did. Um, but the other thing we've got is uh, dimensions. Dimensions, idiot. Dimensions, dimensions of your piston ring gaps, dimensions of your pistons dimensions of your cylinders stuff like that because this came from a used run bike i'd imagine that the cylinders are pretty good because they come from yamaha the pistons could be out of spec let's just hope that they're not because <laughs> then you've got a real problem um you know your tolerances on how wide your pistons are stuff like that the fact that the bike run for quite a while makes me think that that wasn't the case 
What would be excellent as well is to get an endoscope and stuff it down your piston, uh, down your uh, spark plug hole, and check out what's going on. Look at your spark plugs. One of the main things I wanted to see was the underside of the piston. With a piston that's fucking hell. With a piston. Twat. With a piston that's running fine, the underside of the piston should look like this basically silvery not too much of a problem i like this one the underside the light's shite in here but you'll get what i mean what i wanted to see is the very little oil that is splashed up there from the crankshaft flinging oil out everywhere did it burn on the underside of the piston i wanted to see the underside of the piston that basically if the piston's really really hot on top and it's really goldy there's hardly any carbon on top of there but the underside of the piston showed signs of burning oil it means that the, the oil that was splashing on the bottom wasn't enough to cool it and the residual oil that was there has just been cooked to a crisp. If you see black on the underside of the piston, you know, that's a good indication of what happened. So the next thing you could look at is the cylinders. Again, something else we, we didn't see, which is a shame. What I wanted to see is actually was the bottom of the piston, at uh, the bottom of the cylinder. So you have a cylinder like this, it's not sleeved, I'm just, you know, whatever. Obviously it's scraped up here, you can see that, it also butted the top of the, the combustion chamber, it butted there, you can see a bit of it micro welding to it. I wanted to see down here, was it still scuffed all the way down and was there signs of wear all the way around the actual piston? If that's happening that means that this cylinder doesn't have any oil and it's just rubbing the entire bloody cylinder. Now you, what you'd expect is you expect um, a lot of wear here and then less and less and less but you'd be able to see things when bits scrape they'll be dragged all the way down. This will get some splashing from the crank churning away down here but if you could see a, a definitive line of it's okay here and then it gets really shitty and, even, and then terribly worse all over the top. You can also see this is from the <coughs> this is from the thrust sides, so you expect to see it down here. I want to see here on the cylinder, on the actual side walls, because this piston isn't really thrusting that much because it's a DeSac cylinder. Because it's a DeSac cylinder, you'd expect it not to fail on the intake side. That's the incredible thing. Um, but with the sacks in and with my 3D printed model, I'll show you. It's not. Slap, uh, slap and slide all on one side and then slap and slide on the other way down. There's actually a transition point where it thrusts on one side, it does this basically. So with the sack cylinders, or cylinders anyway, it doesn't uh, slap and scrape all the way up here on that way and then slap and scrape all the way down. It actually does this. It slaps and scrapes like that. Like I said, the, the, the 3D printed model parts when we do the sack cylinders, I'll show you um, exactly why and how this works. Um, it's all to do with Conrod angle and the transition of forces of as you're coming up and away and then towards and uh, up and away and then towards and up as well. So the piston slaps one side and then it slaps the other, and then on the reverse it slaps that side and slaps the other on the on the way down. And seeing the cylinders would show you a lot of that. The moral of the story is with this is that if you have a failure, um, before you go on, if you are like they are, quickly get these parts out. We want it back together. Just say you are racing or something like that, or you need this bike because it's a mode of transport. Take as many pictures as you can, as many pictures as you can, in uh, really good light, in focus. Take three or four pictures. If you've got a phone, take a picture. Oh no, take a picture, take a picture. Take a few angles. Because when you look uh, like a week later or whatever, or when you look the next day, oh fuck, it's out of focus and I've just sent it off to where is it? You know what I mean? Take three or four pictures from slightly different angles. Maybe you get a bit of glare and it fucks it all up, it messes it all up. You need to take as many pictures as you can. What I do and what we do at work generally is you just open PowerPoint and put every single picture on a slide and either as the title or something just type out what it is. You know because when you look at a cylinder especially if you've got a single cylinder sometimes if you're taking a picture of the cylinder wall you don't know if that's the 
intake side, the exhaust side, or whatever. While it's fresh in your mind, just make sure that you basically, you know, categorise everything and say what everything is. You guys can even send me um, PowerPoint presentations like that. It doesn't have to be a presentation. Literally just a page, the picture, you know, just a little picture like this and then just say this is you know left hand side or exhaust side cylinder that's all you do and you can just put just slap them all in there this is what we do when we're doing quick failure analysis because we've got haven't got that much time take as many fucking pictures as you can many pictures as you can um because it helps you diagnose things later on if you don't have the stuff at hand um you know, stuff like that's extremely important. I'm forever taking pictures of bloody everything. Um, you know, like of the RD, RG500, stuff like that. Just so I build up a catalogue of pictures so I can look at stuff. Because, you put this engine back together, and then two months later it goes pop. I want to know what these things look like before it went pop. What did I miss? Did I miss anything? Is there just an inherent problem? Probably something I've fucking done. But you get what I mean. It's That's just what you have to do. So, to summarise all this, because this is going on forever, uh, number one, you understand the system and all the rest of it, understand the principles, but don't make any assumptions. You think you know what it is, it doesn't matter, right? Don't, it's very hard for a human to do, you look at something and go, I think I know what that is. Don't automatically assume, because the main fault of that problem may be actually something else. In a sense, the video I did with the R3, you look at it, you go, oh, it's fueling. It's fueling. And then you go down that, oh, it's coolant. And then you go down that rabbit hole of, let's change the coolant, let's get a bigger, better oil water pump. This is the other problem. If you don't do a thorough examination of the whole failure and the whole thing as a system as a whole and look for little bits and look for clues, um, look for damage in other regions, how exactly did that piston lift up? Where are the bits? Where did they go? Let's have loads of pictures of them cylinders. Let's just absolutely look at everything. If you don't have them, um, and you go and stick a new water pump on it, or you go and put Evans in it, or you go and change your radiator cap, or you do all bloody three, you ride it, second race, it goes pop again, exactly the same fault. And you might go, oh, it's obviously not that. Yeah, but that's expensive, and that's not the way you go around failure at analysing things, doing an FA on. Hope that makes sense, and I'll see you in a bit.